Hello class, welcome to Supply and Demand lesson number two. Now, just to make sure that you follow lesson number one and you think you understand that, here's a good test to see if you really do. Could you explain to someone why it's important to never use the word demand or the word supply by itself, how it's confusing? Or can you explain to someone the difference between a demand curve, which doesn't shift when a price changes, and the quantity demanded, which does increase or decrease when the price changes. If you can explain those things, you're in good shape. Can you explain why those two true-false statements that both seem true in lesson one are inconsistent with each other because in one case they move together and in the other case they move in opposite directions? Can you explain why that happens? If you can, you're in good shape. Okay, so on to lesson number two or determinants of supply and demand curves. So let me move this out of the way. So we say determinants of supply and demand curves, but you might say you might think of it as things that move demand curves. All right, so I've made a list here. This is a list of five items, but the real list is much larger. You might find uh, two or three more listed in your textbook. So I'm just going to go over the major ones, but just keep in mind that there are others. These are all kind of obvious change in income. When your income goes up, most people would say that you buy more of stuff, more things. So that's that would be normal. When your income goes up, you buy more of something. Those things are called normal goods. But there are some goods that when your income goes up, you buy less. Or the opposite, when your income goes down, you buy more of those things. Those goods are called inferior goods. It's unfortunate that we have that term, inferior good, because they're really not inferior. It just has to do with the relationship between sales of those goods and income. So st students make a great example of inferior goods. You just ask them, what are the kinds of things that you're buying now that later, when you graduate and you make the big bucks, you won't buy so much of that anymore? And oftentimes they will offer up things like uh, ramen noodles or... Uh, Chef Boyardee canned spaghetti or uh, trips to uh, uh, the Goodwill or uh, cheap ballpoint pens, you know, things like that. So when their incomes go up, they'll probably buy uh, less of that stuff. All right, the second one is change in the price of substitutes. Now, two substitutes or substitutes are things that you use together. A technical definition would be goods A and B are substitutes if when the price of A goes up, the demand curve for B goes up. When the price of A goes up, the demand curve of B goes up. Now there are obvious substitutes and there are many listed in your book. They would be things like hamburgers and hot dogs, jacket or a sweater, but uh, shoes or sandals. But I make a big deal in my classes about non-obvious substitutes, which are very important, but they get very little uh, press or very little text in books. Non-obvious substitutes would be two things that compete for the same consumer dollar but they perform very different functions. For example, can a pizza dinner be a substitute for a movie? Well these are two very different things but imagine it's a Friday night and you're trying to think of something to do with that special someone. Well, maybe you have only enough money to go get a pizza dinner or to go to the movies, but not enough money to do both. They become substitutes for each other. My favorite example is, can a boat be a substitute for a car? And oftentimes students will say, well, yeah, if you live in Venice or in the Louisiana Bayou. But no, I mean, if you live pretty far from the water, can a boat be a substitute for a car? And the answer is, well, yes, it can. It still can. Here's how. Imagine you already have a car, which is the most obvious case when people go to buy a new car. They already have a car, but there's something about the car they don't like. It's too big or it's too small, it's too old, it's too unreliable, uh, something that they don't like. And they're thinking about buying a new car. But before they buy that, they must sit down and ponder, okay, a new car costs a lot of money. What are the other things that I could do with that money besides buy a new car? I could just fix up my old car and use the money to do, and whatever that answer is, is a substitute. They might use the money to buy a, put a down payment on a new house, put
put braces on all their children, take a fabulous vacation, or even buy a boat. So all the things that that person might think about to do with the money besides buy a new car would be a substitute for a car. So remember, they're obvious and they're non-obvious substitutes. Kind of like the opposite of substitutes would be compliments, the price of compliments. Compliments are two things that you use together, like hot dogs and hot dog buns. Uh, a technical definition of compliments would be two goods are compliments, or goods A and B are compliments, if when the price of A goes up, the demand curve for B goes down. So if hot dogs got very expensive, the demand curve for hot dog buns would go down. All right. The fourth one is change in taste and preferences. This is kind of a catch-all for all those kind of subjective things like changes in fashion or as you get older maybe you buy things that you didn't buy when you were younger. All that stuff gets lumped together in taste and preferences. And last there's expectations. I almost hate to list this one because it's a, it's a sucker determinant for students. They always gravitate to that. But I almost never pick that one on an exam. Expectations go like this. If you, as a consumer, thought something was going to be more expensive in the future, you might rush out and buy it today. On the other hand, if you thought it was going to be cheaper in the future, you might hold back and buy it later. The most obvious example would be sometimes people wait till after Christmas to buy things they need because they know they'll go on sale. All right, so those are the determinants of demand curves, and I've listed this other one called others, and those are just all the things that I haven't bothered to put up there in my short list. You can see a few of them in your textbook, like the number of people in a community, uh, the weather maybe, if it's a product that you use outdoors. The, the list is really quite unbounded, so I've only gone over the major ones. All right, so now we have determinants of supply curves, or things that move the supply curve. And this list is a little bit shorter. First, there's change in technology. As we find new and better ways to do things, that causes the supply curves to shift to the right or to increase. Also, changes in the cost of inputs. So the cost of inputs would be like the cost of labor, the cost of raw materials, uh, the cost of energy, and I've included also the cost of taxes. Now, some books will list taxes as a separate determinant of supply curves, but I think it fits in there because it is a cost of doing business. So you can list it with me as uh, point number two, or you can list it separate. It doesn't matter, but taxes are a cost of doing business, and they will move a supply curve. Then there's opportunity cost. This is the hardest one for students to get. They always stumble here, and I always put one, a question about opportunity cost on every exam. So look at my old exams, and you will see Opportunity cost is basically what you give up by doing one thing instead of something else. Um, I remember when I was a student taking this class that that was a concept hard for me. So I'm going to come back to it in a minute, maybe try to help you a little bit. And last is expectations. So in this case, now put yourself in the shoes of the producer. So let's say you're a producer and you're about to bring your product to market. If you thought the price would be higher in the future, you might hold your product back off the market a little while and wait for the higher price. Or on the other hand, if you thought the price was going to be lower in the future, you might go ahead and rush it to market today. Okay, so those are our determinants of supply curves, and of course I've listed others, and you might find a few others in your book, but uh, just know that I've only listed the uh, top four and there are other things that can move a supply curve. All right, so let's go back to that uh, determinant of supply curves called opportunity cost. And here's my favorite example to help illustrate what that's all about. Imagine Farmer Brown's got this farm, and she has four equal fields. And in those four fields, she's uh, planted cotton, soybean, corn, and tomatoes. And she's been doing this maybe for a while. Maybe she rotates them around or something. But then, Imagine that something happens, like maybe the price of cotton goes way up. You know, who knows? Maybe there's bad weather in India or some, the bow weevil gets into the Chinese cotton. I don't know. But somehow the price of cotton in the United States goes way up. What might Farmer Brown do? 
Well, she would probably do something like this. She will probably, like, you know, plant more cotton than before, where previously her fields were maybe equal. Now she'll have a big old field of cotton, and she'll plant less soybean, tomatoes, and corn. I hope you can see that the supply curves for soybean, tomatoes, and corn would all decrease and uh, because she would need the acreage to plant all that cotton. In the language of economics, we would say it like this. The opportunity cost of planting soybean, tomatoes, or corn has gone up because there's more money to be made planting cotton. I hope you can see this and just be warned that uh, on every test, Sooner or later, there's some question about opportunity cost. All right, so now let's talk about these shifts in the demand curve. So here's this uh, sketch that you saw in lesson one. And remember now, when the price moves from P1 to P2, the demand curve doesn't move at all. All that happened was that the quantity demanded moved. But now, let's imagine that one of those determinants of demand curves changed. And now we have this new demand curve out there to the right called demand curve two. Oftentimes, students will indicate that that's an upward shift in the demand curve. And if you do that on my test, I'll give you full credit, but I warn against it. I don't think that's a good way to describe what's happened because it'll be confusing when you get to the supply curves, which you will see in a minute. It's much better to think of that shift in the demand curve as a shift to the right. Now, if you take a minute and think about all the possible prices not just the two I've listed there, but all the possible prices and the corresponding quantities demanded. I hope you can see that for demand curve two, the quantities demanded would all be greater than they would have been for demand curve number one. So that's an increase in the demand curve and it's a shift to the right. I haven't drawn the decrease, but it would be a shift back to the left. All right, so let's do the same thing for a supply curve. A supply curve shifting out to the right would look like that, but if you thought of this as an upward or downward shift, that looks like moving down. It looks like the supply curve moved down. That's why it's so confusing. Can you imagine being in a test and a little bit rattled, and now when the demand curve moves up, that's an increase, but when the supply curve moves down, that's an increase. So I don't recommend you learn it that way. It's very dangerous. Instead, what you, sh what you should do is think of the shift as a right or leftward shift. And if you do it this way, the rule is exactly the same for a demand curve as it is for a supply curve. When the supply curve shifts to the right, that's an increase in the supply curve. I haven't drawn the decrease in the supply curve, but it would just be a shift back to the left. All right, so that's it for lesson number two. And uh, I hope you find it helpful and uh, you really should read the book and try some of the exercises at the back of the book it will help you the next lesson is about putting the supply and demand curve together and finding equilibrium which we call static analysis so hope you find this helpful good luck